Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, ex-Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny Beatty, and former France international, Benjamin Kayser. We've got a very special double World Cup winning All Black guest joining us shortly. But just as importantly as that, Benji, you're back. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, thank you. Um, I, 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 I never left, but <laughs> um, it's one of those... Uh, situations where you know you, you have to say yes and um, and Johnny was there so he, he, he can witness but there is a I, I put a lot of importance in the relationships that you build with the boys and when you're talking about upfront especially tight five there's guys in my career when I was young who really really helped me so if I if I try to open up a little bit to you to you guys I was really good when I was young <laughs> <laughs> no, but listen, but, but I was quite weak mentally. I was quite, I was really good ball in hand. I was really athletic, whatever. But no one is about doing the grinding, really hard, tough motherfucker stuff of, of hooker. That, that really wasn't me. That's the main reason why I went to Left the Tigers, to be honest, because I wanted to challenge myself like that. I was like, listen, who are the toughest out there? And Leicester were definitely all the way up. So I thought that was, it was a challenge because I always try to rise up to it. So but, but I'm very comfortable to, to tell you that if I was so lucky at the beginning of my career, it's because I was surrounded by some absolute rugby monsters. Um, I mean, I started in 2004. There was Rodrigo Roncero Lucet, Argentinian doctor of his state, but just a butcher of a player. Sylvain Marconet tighted, Peter de Villiers tighted. And the, the fourth one was a guy called Pablo Lemoine, probably not really renowned in the UK, but in France. Monster of a fella, like would break people in half, sort of Trevor Leota type of tackling. And, and hell of a scrummager. And I was surrounded by guys like that. Mike James, Bibi Radu in the second row. You know, at the time, they were bossing and policing European rugby in the rucks and all that. So I was super, super privileged to be surrounded by, by such monsters around me. And so we built a really close uh, bond. But obviously, then life goes on. Internet guys live in, you know, back in Argentina, everywhere in France. I don't live in France anymore. We all have busy lives and stuff. So it's a bit complicated. And on Saturday, after a good, well, two weeks ago now, after a good France Argentina game, I'm having a few beers with Johnny and um, Rory Lawson, who I get along well with. And even Johnny looks at me, he's like, well, what's up? And I just looked at my phone and I got a voice note from Rodrigo Oncero. You know, when it just pops up, what's up? I never speak to him, but I was probably one of the, we were like the closest when I was from 2004, 2007, really, really close, rooming all the way together, considering how much he snores. That's like, a, I should get a medal for it. <laughs> uh, but but he, he gave me back, you know, a thousand times. And him and his family, I really got close with. Uh, and because I was the Frenchie who could speak Spanish, I was always sort of the interlink with all the RGs and stuff, and especially with him. And, and he's like, I'm in Paris. You know, it's one of those challenging texts. I'm in Paris. I'll be at that bar in one hour. Done. And that's all it said. I there was no it. challenge. It's not like, oh, I would love to see you. No, 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 no. It's, that's all it said. And then 45 seconds later, I get a text from Sylvain Marconet. Me and Rodrigo will be at this bar in one hour. Done. Um, and so obviously I text back, whatever. And then they call me in the taxi. I was like, right, listen, right, this is too good to be true. I, 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 I swear, Johnny, and I promise you on this, my only plan was to have a few beers with you guys and then shoot back to my parents because I have a flight the next day. And obviously went to meet them. And it was the beauty of, I was, I was, I mean, even almost to the point of being choked up with emotion, happy of seeing them because it was just so cool. Uh, because there's boy, they're boys that I really like. And it, it's rare that we can just press pause, look at each other and like, oh shit, it's like a good old, you know, it's like 15 years ago, proper deja vu of, of sharing those moments with him, of, with them. Um, the former manager of the, of the club, Alain Elias, who was a really, really funny guy who then moved a bit. I don't know if you had him in Montpellier, Johnny, but he went to Montpellier for a little bit. And he's one of those charismatic. There's always one guy, like I, I don't know him personally at all, but the, the Welsh physio or strength and conditioning guy that they always speak about who then went Bobby Stretching. Bobby. So there's always one guy, you know, who's sort of the life and the soul of a, of a club. And Alain Elias was that in Stade Francais. He was the only, you know, manager that would then be better at seven o'clock in the morning, uh, a planking competition, and he's there doing <laughs> nine minutes, whatever. That on a night out swore that he was going to run the Paris Marathon. And he did it. At like age 55, he almost collapsed 700 times, but he still did it. He finished it. And he was like always up there for a bet and stuff. And he, and he was there because the boys texted him. He's like, oh, yeah, I'll be there. Done. Then Pierre Abadon comes, who now works for the the, the yeah. Carnival of Paris. And he's really busy with all the Olympics coming and stuff. But so, Gonzalo Quesada, who's coach of Stad, who I played with in 2005, um, came by. It was just really, really cool. 
so um, a, a beautiful night. To be honest, we didn't finish that bollocked, but pretty late, yes. Um, what time? Well, uh, I'm, 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 I, I, <laughs> my mother, I'm sure, listens to the podcast, so I'm, I'm not going to give you time because I told her, that, well, did you really come out there? No, 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 sure. You I told, to told Andre it was midnight. Kitchen. That's all we need to know. <laughs> but, uh, no, listen, really, really good. Um, and I'll put you in the confidence a couple of days after I sent a message to Rodrigo um, about you know this whole quote in 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 rugby of Jean-Pierre Rive, which is you know the cascador, the guy with the long blonde hair, mm-hmm. who's a really poetic guy. He always said rugby is a, is is a, is a sport of mates and a ball, and when the ball is not there, the mates stay. And that's really the way that I picture it. And I I told him, and he sent me a long message. I think he must have still be on the piss. He was properly <laughs> caught up by emotion. Let's not wait another ten years. You're right, Emma. you know. So it's just it's the beauty of those sincere human relationships. And rugby, not rugby. I'm sure you guys have got mates where you just see them 10 years after and absolutely nothing's changed other than the fact that he looks like Santa Claus because his, white, his hair is white and his beard is white. But other than that, absolutely nothing's changed. And is there a Georgian equivalent of Rodrigo Roncero for last weekend, Benji? Just, did you get a text from a Georgian saying, meet me, midnight, this bar? No, no, <laughs> no, no, no. But, but no, we had a really good night um, the night before in Georgia because I've got, I've got Eden Park shops. To all our listeners, if they want not a discount, you know they can ask me. <laughs> but um, no, no, I've I've got Eden Park shops that I that I opened that I partnered up with the tight that I used to play with when I was seventeen. Who also mentored me a little bit. Who was a little bit older, uh, went to school and stuff. Who's the cousin of Julien Marchand? His name is Nicolas Marchand. Same family, and that's how I know the family, the Marchand family, so well. Um, and uh, and we've got shops now in Bordeaux and and in Toulouse. And so you see, he came over for the game. And so him, who speaks absolutely broken English, hanging out with Paul Grayson, same lower <laughs> winter, and uh, and Connor was really good fun. But Ireland beating New Zealand uh, just gave that e- extra element of motivation for us to enjoy a good time. We had a proper dinner, definitely not the same sort of rhythm in terms of intensity, but so definitely not as tired the next day. And Johnny, you were in Bordeaux as well. How was your weekend? Um, I ended up back. Where was I? I ended up back in Edinburgh for Scotland, South Africa, with your mate Flip Van der Merv. Um, and what a beast he is. Again, you talk about good people, smart people, intelligent people. That guy is an absolute beast. Um, so we went from Beerts to Stansted together. We sat down for lunch. We had a few phone calls. And every time I had a new phone call, there'd be a new pint of lager in front of me. The guy was just <laughs> like, I don't know where he puts it, man. An absolute freak show. So by the time we got to Edinburgh, we were stinking. Um, we then did all the hospitality together for Scotland, South Africa, which was great fun, a real laugh uh, up on stage, taking the piss out of each other. And, and like you, I got to catch up with old rugby mates, so Dave Denton, Hugo Southwell, Tim Visser, Nathan Hines. Um, so just good fun uh, and really nice to catch that game. Um, and then straight back over. So as soon as the final whistle went, was on a flight from Edinburgh to Amsterdam, Amsterdam to Bordeaux, got on at about midnight, so missed the dinner with you guys and then it was just the France Georgia game that got in the way it was actually really nice to to get over caught up with you Benji very briefly a big bear hug on the way up to commentary position caught up with Sean Edwards I'm not sure if you bumped into Sean as well and um, so managed to catch up with him again really briefly just he was just mentioning how much he's enjoying living near Perpignan enjoying getting to watch some of the Catalan Dragons some rugby league and he's really settled in and enjoying it with the French 15 and the French squad so that was really cool to find out and then that was it onto the game commentary and back straight down the road so not too heavy not too much drinking um a good weekend of rugby though uh this weekend's going to be a little bit more quiet with just one game but a big game coming up so looking forward to um a rerun what was the name because again i got the name wrong laura winter told me the name of the nightclub was pussy creamers and i'm sure it's not the name of the nightclub so if you're out in paris this weekend benji what's the name of it it's called pousse au crime push to the crime but it's it's like exactly this road that is pretty self-explanatory in in the in quartier de saint germain that all the rugby lovers uh, of france will know called rue de la soif you know the road of of thirst so it's pretty it's it's pretty straightforward there's no museums out there let's just tell you uh, it's basically bars and restaurants all over, um, and this is this has been sort of a, a rugby institution. Uh, it's a, it's the smallest rugby institution you would. You it's would amazing see, considering how big the fellas are in there. But it's it was always the the go to place uh, when I, when I was young. Symbolically, I finished there after my last game after the top fourteen final with Flip, 
uh, we ended up very very late but but it was good fun just to to hit hit home hit base you know let's have a chat about that france georgia game on sunday then before we bring in our double world cup winning all black to look ahead to this weekend we were sat here a week ago talking about the changes that fabian galtier was rumored to be making yeah and he pretty much made all of them so mm. uh, how did cameron Wocky go in the second row how did seku makalu get on oh um look it was a bit of a turgid game i'm not sure what you thought benji um France just sort of looked a little bit unsettled when they were on the ball. Um, quite a lot of unforced errors. Um, Georgia were actually really competitive and decent for 15, 20 minutes, and then the wheels kind of came off. The, the people that came in, Wocky was in second row. Um, again, his athleticism and aerial ability was great at line at time. He forced a couple of turnovers, put real pressure on Georgia. One led directly to one of France's tries. Ka, but Makalu, poor bugger. Um, Again, first touch in backfield throws like a five-meter forward pass, knocked the ball on once in contact, knocked the ball out in the wide channels, just, I don't know, almost looked like a deer in the headlights. And I genuinely, during commentary, felt bad for him because there's, there's not many times that you get that chance to start and it doesn't quite click. And that's been two or three games that he's been involved in and it hasn't quite gone for him. Again, the ratings that come out in the press, Benji, a little bit experienced of this as well with Rugby Rama, like just cruel, like a three and a half out of 10, shouldn't be playing again. But the guy just looks like, he looks unsettled. Before he'd even touched the ball, he looks unsettled on the field. It's a slightly different game plan and he struggled to work his way in the game. But he's undoubtedly one of the most talented players in France. And, and as we mentioned before, like he covers wing. I think from the speed testing they did, Benji, you'll be able to back this up or, or verify, he's actually the fastest player in the French squad. So an absolute freak show, full of talent, and just needs time to settle. So, look, he didn't he didn't kick on. He settled in the second half a little bit. He was calling lineouts as there were changes. He called really well, everything to himself. Georgia weren't contesting, so it was easy to look good. But, look, you'll be disappointed, as will the coaching side. Um, but I just really hope that they don't turf him out. I think he's injured this weekend. And I just hope that he gets to come back, gets another chance, because undoubtedly he's got the natural talent and ability to really kick on and be a star for them. But this weekend wasn't his weekend. He, he he just he, he missed he missed a shot. That that's that's all there is to it. There was an opportunity given. He could have been a massive change against the All Blacks to say right. He, he literally can be a guy who will decide whether we will do uh, cause an upset or not. He is the guy, your X factor player, your you know statistics breaker, your you, the guy who just thinks of something outside the box who can make some sort of magic happen. He can, but he he just he didn't have a good game against Georgia. Done. So that's an opportunity left again. But it's, it's only the first or second time that it happens. And it was just very, very frustrating not to see his, his talent shine. Um, so it, I just, it's, it's an occasion loupé, uh, an opportunity that just, you know, is going to fly over, above his head in front of his nose and he's barely going to smell it. And I'm, I'm not sure when the next one is going to be because there's some incredible back row players that are everywhere out there. Um, just so a lot of frustration not to see properly shine with his god-given talent because he bloody hell he's he's got some um and now and now the rest well Cameron Wokey did did, did did his job I think uh, I agree with you Johnny he just did what he had to to, to do and I think he he behaves properly uh, Winnie Antonio brought some solidity he had to front up with the scrum and globally the, the, the scrum was positive during the game Matisse Lebel did what he had to do brought a little bit of sparkle a few hot steps could look dangerous but gradually um Overall, he only got the balls that, you know, when the, everything shifts basically to the touchline and you get it where you just have to do one side step, not go to go to touch and, and, and recycle the ball. That's all there is to it. But the main, main element of satisfaction is just a little bit of improvement between uh, Romain Tamak and Mathieu Jalibert's uh, partnership, which obviously was the main thing. I think, um, so I was commentating just above the, 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 the French staff. And I could tell that they were sort of looking and Laurent Labitte was looking at um, how guys were, you know, stepping in, stepping out. There was some really interesting moment where Romain Tanak ended up stepping in at 10 and Mathieu Jalibert was there. So there was a little bit more interaction. There's the force, first phase of play where they almost score with Damien Pono uh, on, on the wing where Gael Ficou trucks it up and they're both guys up in their hands and you can use the, the, the passing power of the two of them. Jalibert attacking the line, hitting it flat to Romain Tamaku in the blink of a second, takes the decision of skipping a guy. That's exactly why they want him there. So it was better. It wasn't perfect, but it was better. Um, and, and surely I think that's the one that's going to be renewed. So I don't want to sound overly uh, dull 
but I don't think there's much to take from that game, to be fair. No, nothing. Other than, other than Georgia are getting better. Georgia have got a lot more to offer than just a positive scrum and, wow, some hard hitters. They've got some pretty big ball carriers that were just there to play, but they play. They play really good, uh, really good rugby. I think that full fullback, Ninashvili, I think. Yes. Said, you know, the amount of tackles he broke. And you, you're going to see him. You're going to hear about him very, very soon. I mean, I think he's 19 or something like that. He's yeah. only broke out uh, on the scene in top 14. He steps everything there is to it. He, he looks absolutely tiny, but he's really good under the high ball, can step, stepped in at 10 at one point because their 10 took a, a yellow and looked really dangerous. So they've got something. They really do have something. So that, that's really positive for them. The more encounters, the better. I think it's the least we owe. When I'm hearing, you know, this whole world where we wanted to change the rules or allowing uh, guys to go back to their home nations, which is a great decision if it, it does go through. And when Piviak was saying, you know, we've, we've, we've taken so much off, off them, it's the least that we could do. Or the least that France can do is to play pretty much at least one third of their games against Georgia or against Fiji or against, you know, all those teams where, the, I mean, what, what was it? 14 of them or something, either playing out of 23, play in France or half play in France in the very recent uh, times. So there's a very tight connection between those guys. Uh, it used to be Argentina, but now with the Jaguares or whatever, they went back and now they're all starting to coming back now. Uh, so Georgia is our distant cousin. It's the least thing we, we, we owe. So not a lot to learn. Disappointing Macalou, better for all the guys. But mainly, I think it's 60th minute when Antoine Dupont walked out with uh, on, his, on his own two feet, looking fresh. I think everybody's out right. Done. It's a victory. The main man is out. He's not injured. Let's move on to next week. The weird thing as well about the game, but it was it was very very unFabian like when France had the ball. Like I could, knowing Fabian, he'll be extremely disappointed with how they looked after the ball, how they generated decent possession and tried to attack Georgia. It was really like it was one man for himself. It was it was not structured, and that's the exact opposite of the way Fabian coaches. So he'll have been pulling his hair out. The one thing that we did see was again like Georgia clearly didn't analyze the game that France played against Argentina, because every time they kicked off the field, France had some sort of starter play that with blockers, with decent lines, like created absolute holes and chaos everywhere. Again, Fabian Galtier and Laurent Labitte. So it just shows you can't give France anything. They can't give them any platform. The tries they scored came from Mall, came from first phase line breaks, from decent lineup break, breakout plays. And there they're really dangerous. I think that the dangerous part for France now is how do they look after ball and how do they generate positive play when they get into multi-phase? And that's where they kind of come unstuck and they cough up the ball. And again, looking ahead to New Zealand, if you cough up turnovers against the quality of backs that all backs have, you're going to be in trouble. So it was a really strange game to watch, like a real arm wrestle, really physical. Um, but because they were given that platform to play from, they managed to break Georgia down and ultimately smash them off the pitch. But for some phases, it was really, really difficult. And when they didn't play together and when they weren't organized, they came unstuck. So it's almost a good game for the coaching staff to take apart and unpick. And you know, Monday, Tuesday, show this is what we need to do together in these situations. This is how we can look after ball better. But ultimately, when they get the platform and this is what we can do off strike, we can get the better of anybody. So parts of it are really encouraging, but they're going to have to get better. Um, and again, as you said, you don't want to get too doom and gloom, but like French press was like really depressed um, over here. French media was really down on them, but look, there was some positive stuff and they're going to have to, like Fabian said, they've got absolutely nothing to lose this weekend and everything to gain. So here's hoping they can lift it a little bit and uh, make it a real game. And from a Georgian perspective, quickly, some of the comments during the game and after the game, they weren't happy about the refereeing at all. Was there anything in that? What did you make of it? I don't know. I heard him during the first half. I heard that it was the captain, Merab, uh, we're going to massacre his last name. Sharikadze. Yeah. Sharikadze. Um, I heard him, he said, he, he, he used, he did the whole Pablo Matera quote, didn't he? He was a bit like, I know we're a small country, I know we're a small team, but I think we deserve to be ref fairly. He threw that at like the 25th minute. I think he threw it after the, just after the penalty try on the driving mall. I was like, mate, to be honest, it, did, it didn't shock me. Uh, yes, they were extremely penalized. I think at halftime is what 13 to 1 in terms of penalty count or something. But they were globally always in defense uh, for the first sort of 25 minutes of the game. Uh, so it's obviously a lot, uh, you, you get pinged a lot more. I, I did think there was a lot of penalties that were there. Every single scrummaging penalty was there. It was at least four or five of them already. Uh, so no, I don't think it was injustice. I'd really like to see the decisions he's talking about because again, from the commentary position, it didn't look like anything was obvious, and it looked like every time 
France would break the line, Georgia would be offside or there'd be some kind of fault. They were put under so much pressure that they kept coming offside or, or doing something ridiculous. And like they're tight head. I don't know how many times he went off his feet floor. to contest for the ball. Yeah. Like, every, so, I mean, every pin, every pin is, 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 is normal on that one. So that's exactly. Already, between the scrum and that one, that's already seven out of 13. <laughs> exactly. So I know it can seem like there's a real weight of the world against you when things are going that way, but France in some as aspects of the game were utterly dominant and they were under the cost. So look, they ended up coughing up a few cheap penalties and, that, and that's the way that, but I mean, if they are serious and they think there's things to be looked at and questioned, then it'd be great to have the images analyzed um, properly. But again, from the commentary position, it didn't look like there was anything untoward. It just it looked like it, it was what it was. And we will come on to talking about selection for this weekend and the All Blacks later on, but you mentioned the Jalabert and Tomac combination and we chatted about it last week as we have done for weeks before as well. Yeah. Is there any danger that they go away from that this weekend? Or is it definitely no. those two? I don't think so. Otherwise, otherwise the, the, the easy way would have been to change last week because there's six-day turnaround. You give them both both a bit of time. I, I, don't, I don't see it happening, no. They could have even, I don't know, they could have potentially uh, getting them both out, leave Antoine Dupont, whatever it is, leave Sekou uh, Makalu on the, on the wing and get them both out, whatever it is. I, I see them starting 10 or 12 again. Uh, they had a plan. They're putting in motion. They had to readjust against Argentina because things weren't going the, the, the way they wanted. And that's why they have Jonathan on the, on the bench, Jonathan Danti, to be there just in case. They want to change their strategy. And fair play to, to Fabien and the staff. 50th minute to change a guy like Romain Tamek is it's not a small decision. But they had to do it because that was the, what was necessary to win that first game. And they did it. Um, so I would be extremely surprised. I think we're talking 99% chance for the both of them to go again. And and they, they stuck to it. They're going to learn from it. And they're going to need to be extraordinary to beat the All Blacks. But that's that's what we expected of them. Especially after you mentioned Benji. That's the best they've been. It's only game two together. Yeah. But that's undoubtedly the best. I know it's Georgia they're playing against. It's not top quality opposition. But it's the first time you really saw in multi-phase, what, what, the intertwine, the, able to lift their heads up and, you know, call to space, pass to space. Again, use that passing quality and use that dual distributor that we hadn't seen before. I mean, and again, once you see both those guys in, in space with time, they're such good runners as well, the pair of them. They're, they're phenomenal talents. So, look, it's two games in, and I think Fabian started this with a plan that that's what he needed to beat the All Blacks if they were going to do it. So there's no way they're going to change now. And how many how many teams try to beat the All Blacks by just putting the biggest bloody pack and the biggest bloody line they could possibly? It kind of work. Right? If it was that easy to beat them, a lot of teams would have done it. it. It's not the case. So I think from the get go, the idea was to say, right, uh, Vincent Vakatawa, whatever, they're not here. We need to adapt. Fair enough. Uh, and if we need to adapt, then what's nice, why not? Let's be clever about it. Let's put the best two players that we've got on there, and especially because their type of playing is maybe going to be the difference maker between just doing another game like everybody else when you're at the 50th minute and you're down by one point and you ended up, you know, conceding 30 against the All Blacks or actually seriously having two guys who can control the game, use that strategy, use some, maybe some kicking game, put them under pressure, make them scratch their heads a bit more than just a normal physical plan of we're going to, you know, burst a hole through the defense. Uh, and they're the two perfect guys to do it. Right, let's have a look ahead to the big one this weekend now, France against the All Blacks. And this is where we were going to bring in a double World Cup winning, former All Black. But he was at the French equivalent of the Oscars, the French rugby equivalent of the Oscars, last night. And we think he might be a bit tired tonight. What's going on, Benji? You know, in France, was les amis de mes amis sont mes amis. So the friends of my friends of my friends are my friends. So basically, because I went on the piss and I skipped one, I think Jerome <laughs> just followed my trends. It's your fault. Yeah, it's, complete, it's completely my fault. I, I'm setting an unprecedented, you know, so they just, uh, attitude reflects leadership, right? So, uh, so, so, so it's a bit of that, I, I don't know. All I know is that when you're two-time World Cup uh, champion and that you know the ABs inside out, whether you have them this week or next week, it's a treat so we can wait a week and be patient. When you've won two World Cups, you can do what you want, can't you? We'll wait, Jerome. We'll exactly. Wait. Attitude reflects leadership. Is that a Remember the Titans quote you've just thrown out on this podcast, 100%. Benjamin Casey? Yes. 100%. I love that. I'm man. loving it. <laughs> loving it. Uh, yeah, Joe messaged last night. Oh, no, Joe. Jerome messaged last night say he was out with Joe Rocococo. So I'd imagine there's quite a few Toulouse boys that won some awards last night. So I think we can excuse them. They've done enough, but hopefully they'll join us next week. It looks like a good night at those Oscars. Have you ever been, Benji? 
Yeah, so it's 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 one of those things. So I saw that it's it, the Oscars were um, were organized by Media Olympique. Media Olympique is sort of the the French rugby bible. It's this yellow piece of newspaper originally that uh, would connect everyone. I remember being 14 or 15 and you would look at the under 16s results. It has every single result that you could possibly find, right? So it's really like that. And then it became obviously a website. It's all digital now. But they be, they, they keep those traditions of, of throwing some crazy good parties where, I mean, look, in the same room, you had the whole starting 15, the 2011 World Cup final that they lost against uh, the ABs. So the Arinor Doki, Jean-Baptiste Poux, Barcela, Damien Trail, Morgan Parra, Yashvili, uh, Julien Bonner, Pascal Papé, all that generation, you know, Rou Rougerie and all those guys, they were all there in one. And it's not the Federation, it's Media Olympique, you know, who decides to call them 10 years after. We might as well have a good night and take a good picture. You know, you know it's Which one was of those cool. cool moments. And then you always have the Oscars where you've got the new generation of the Cyril Baez and the Julien Marchand and uh, all the Toulouse boys are carving it. And you only had Jerome Kano, John Eels, and uh, was it Gareth Edwards, I think, who was there. So you also have some absolute rugby legends who come. They're all happy to be there and just to, 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 to hang around. The only thing that always shocked me, and that's proper French, is that bloody hell, you don't do it the week of the ABs. <laughs> yeah. Just do it Just do it some other week whenever you want, but don't do it the week where, you know, Marcoussi is an hour away from Paris. So to get yourself inside Paris, you need to take some sort of taxis and stuff like Antoine Dutron. Let him be in a hot tub somewhere. You know, let him you know, be in a cryotherapy thing, a, a, a sleeping chamber and all that. But we have to put it that week. So I've been to those things, yes. Normally after a long day of double training in between international tests where you're flogged and you just don't want to speak to anyone. So I'm guessing uh, Antoine Dupont, that's, that's the added uh, responsibilities that you have on your captain. And you've basically got every single title and trophy that you could possibly have in the last three years. Did you ever win anything, Benji? No, 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 no. Probably Any nom nom nominations? I think, I think there was, the, I was the uh, unofficial, unofficial um, nicest bloke to have a beer with, but that was a competition. <laughs> yeah. I noticed as well, you mentioned that photo of the 2011 team. I think it was only two people that didn't make it, one of which was Mark Lievermont, the coach that called yeah. him the Salgos. So you can imagine why he wasn't there, wouldn't have been exactly welcome. Let's look ahead to the All Black game this weekend then. And France have lost the last 14 against New Zealand <laughs> since 2009. Not <laughs> the only bring one. You down, Benji. Don't, don't, yeah. don't take it. They're not the only one, all right? <laughs> True, but is this the time, Benji? Is this the time? <laughs> I don't know, but I, I, I'm all across everything that I've got in my body. Um, I don't think it's ever a time to take them. It's never a good time or a bad time or whatever. All I know is that they haven't lost two in a trot, or the only time they lost two consecutively is, uh, I, I, I didn't look this up. I'm just spilling somebody else's <laughs> info here. I don't get Recently. me wrong. Absolutely. Um, but it was, it was recently, was it Argentina and Australia back-to-back, uh, -back, and that's the last yeah. time in, the, in, in this decade. Yeah. Or in the last 10 years. So obviously it doesn't happen very often. They're an outstanding team. Now they got bullied against uh, Ireland. They didn't just lose. They really got uh, bluntly dominated. And they're, they're even fighting for their lives on that line for like, what, five, six minutes consecutively uh, before the end of the first half for, for Ireland when we thought, holy shit, maybe they, they, let, they let it go. They let it slip once again. And then again, they came back in the second half. So it's not like a, a small, small intercept uh, quarterfinal 2007 in Cardiff, France, New Zealand in the World Cup. <gasps> you know, they beat them. What an upset. It was just a crazy game with a forward pass uh, that wasn't um, taken back or, or try that was given for a forward pass. They got bl blown out of the park. So that really means that they can be dominated. That's what I'm trying to say. That they were beating by a better side. And Ireland played beautifully in that game. Um, so this doesn't teach us much for, for, for our game, but it just means that if France perform an incredible game, they can beat them. Um, I think they will need to bring on something special. They will need to outperform them. They will need to outplay them, outheart them, uh, outdiscipline them. They will have to have, you mentioned the strategy of, of Fabien Galtier and stuff. I'm sure he's going to have some clever thing inside his pockets. Sean Edwards is going to have to come up with some clever thing, you know, to put them under pressure. Um, we're going to have to have the line, same line out platform and have the same skill. And the only thing that I'm hoping is that Antoine Dupont has been pretty quiet for the last two weeks. Um, he's only going to play maybe a star against Aaron Smith, who I remember we spoke about this a couple of months ago gave them the, the title of best player in the world. And all of a sudden they come and they play against each other. 
because because there's an injury there. So this that's you know a clin d'œil du destin, a blink from from faith, um, and I, I believe in that. So whatever happens, I want to see how France can measure up against the best, and obviously all the All Blacks are part of the best, uh, and then let the best team win. And does that Ireland win not? show france how it's done johnny do, can france replicate that do they have to play a different way um france essentially have to play their perfect game I'm, i'd say last week ireland like when you break it down there were certain aspects um that it was their perfect game that the line speed the pressure they put new zealand under made them look ordinary at times which is extremely rare to see happen at international level it doesn't happen essentially ever to the all blacks um but the incessant line speed, the physicality, the way they caught them on the gain line, Sean Edwards will have noted all of that. Um, and they absolutely have to replicate that defensive performance and quash anything that New Zealand do in attack. But what was really interesting by Ireland was how they attacked, how they were able to retain the ball, how they got every contact correct, how they were their numbers, how they, they threatened the, the AB's defensive line. And they did it time and time again. They held onto ball and New Zealand couldn't get near it. Like there's been a lot of criticism as well of um, of Blackadder of being an absolute workhorse, but not as physical. They just physically couldn't affect Ireland. Um, and that's just not something in world rugby you're used to seeing to, to, to the All Blacks looking a little bit ordinary um, or normal for what of another word um, in the physical aspects of the game. So France have the physical capability to do it. Um, but defensively, they're going to have to do it time and time again on the game line. Defensively, again, against Georgia and against Argentina, they've looked solid. They're much better than they ever have been defensively, in my opinion, under Sean Edwards. But the key, having watched the last two games for France, will be their attack. If they're able to retain possession, if they can pressurize this Kiwi defense time and time again and put them under pressure, and when they get opportunities, convert um, their points. So, look, I, I think what Ireland showed and proved last week is that even though you have less firepower, if you have your perfect game and New Zealand are off because you pressurize them by five or six or 7%, anything can happen. And again, it wasn't a massive margin of victory in the end, but it was just enough. And I think that's exactly the same. If France are to win this weekend, there's going to be a massive step up in pretty much everything they've showed in the last two weekends. Um, but anything's possible. So um, it's possible, it can be done, but they essentially have to have their perfect game and they have to pressurise New Zealand for 80 minutes and make sure that they can't breathe. It's going to take a massive effort from the crowd as well. Like People will be desperate to see this game. It's, it's the first test as well of the 2023 World Cup for France and New Zealand. Um, and this is a massive showdown of bragging rights, of knowing what to expect in a year and a half's time. Um, and it's huge. For the support that's back in the stadium, which again, Benji, you have noticed in Bordeaux, incredible again to have fans back it was the same for Argentina but there's only two of the three tiers open at the Stade de France um, and the French 15 23 is going to need every single tier all three tiers open it'll be a sellout um, if they're going to get pushed home beat New Zealand uh, it's going to be incredibly tough you never know um, but they have to be perfect in pretty much everything they do oh, but this one this one is going to be absolutely jam-packed and I think it yeah. was sold out six months ago it, the place is going to be absolutely buzzing it, it is going to be an extraordinary moment of sport uh, I, I consider that we're really mega privileged to be there um, for, for, for that day it's going to be absolutely incredible I mean I've got shivers just, just even thinking about it just two points that, I, that are really important and that are really well spotted by you Johnny is the how did Ireland win? They, they, they relentlessly kept the ball possession and attacked. And they were absolutely incredible. To a point where you're like, ooh, you're beginning to be silly. You need to kick in the corners. You're overexposing Too yourself. Much. But I think they had in their mind two things that were really important to say. If we're going to actually have a shot at beating them, you need to go over and beyond your limits of risk-taking in terms of ball possession. So you need to overplay. Right, the thing that Clermont we were world champions at, but all of a sudden it would it would count it was counter fire at some point. And secondly, they knew that the All Blacks is not a team that you can beat by one point. Impossible. You need to beat them beat them by at least eight. And that's the, in their mindset. They were constantly saying we need to be one try one converted try safe. And I thought it was really clever in the second half because they were dominant. Right? They, they were ahead, right? Most of the game. I think they were only behind in the score for, what, 20 minutes or something. And it was never enough. And there's moments where you're like, right, I'm three points ahead, six points ahead. I can start to control. I can kick in the corners. I can, you know, see how it goes. I can give away just a little bit of possession. And that's when they kill you. 
That's, that's when they absolutely take you by the throat and they chop you in pieces. And they were all over the place in the second half and they scored one brilliant try under the sticks. Ooh, they're back in business. And that's where the, uh, the Irish were so clever is that they didn't stop playing. They didn't try to control something that was uncontrollable until they were at plus nine. And did you see the, the, the imagery of the guys and stuff? They just wanted, they were at plus six, plus six, four minutes or six minutes to the game. It, they were playing left, right and center. They were not controlling. They were not being in strategy. Johnny Sexton was not turning the corner and, you know, bombing high balls and just hoping to get it back. And that's what was really clever. So where I do agree with you, I think France has got a little bit more um, firepower or striking power, whatever you want to say it. So maybe they don't need to hold that ball as long, but if they can get inspired by something that the Irish did is relentlessly impose your ball possession. And secondly, always aim to be more than seven, which means never let your foot off the pedal, even if you're at plus six. And to back you up with stats, Benji, the All Blacks made in the first half of last week's game 158 tackles, which is the most by a tier one nation in six years, which just shows how much possession Ireland retained. Uh, but again, there's not many teams in the world with that little position having to be forced into making that many tackles that win games. So yeah. they made 231 in the end, which again is a ridiculous stat, but there's not many, like that's if you're playing complete wet weather rugby, Glasgow against Ulster, and it's horrible, you might expect one side of dominance, loads of tackles, and you might eke three points. And it's that kind of game. But the way Ireland dominated possession, New Zealand were forced to soak and absorb and they just kept getting pegged back and pegged back. And again, you mentioned the firepower. France do have the firepower, but in terms of, I'm looking at clearers, I'm looking at structures, I'm looking at cells together, working together. That was the one bit that worries me from that Georgia performance was they just, they were a little bit disjointed. And if you're going to step up and hold the ball against New Zealand, even though you have a bit more fire and a wee bit more power, just that next level of organization. And I'm sure that's what Fabian will have said in the review. He'll have showed all of the images of, one player busting off the back of them all by himself without support runners or somebody doing a pick and go in the wrong direction when they have a certain system for how they want to pick and go and saying, look, if we're going to keep the ball against these boys, we have to do every single level and every single step. It has to be yes done with passion and power, but it has to be organized and we have to be together um, like the Irish were. Um, that's what they're going to have to do if they win. And it might be a disadvantage for France that the All Blacks lost last weekend because you mentioned it, Benji. They don't lose two in a row very often. But Johnny mentioned the tackle count there. I don't know if you've ever played in a game where you've made 231 tackles. That's going to take it out of you, isn't it? I don't know, mate. Um, let's not forget it's a six-day turnaround for France, whether it's a seven-day turnaround for the for the ABs. Uh, I think I saw Liner Brown, the, the centre, is out. <sighs> They've got 750 guys behind. I don't think that will be the excuse. It's also the last game of their season, if I'm, if I'm uh, not mistaken. So there's also that element of finish on a high, give it all. But France are going to be backed by 85,000 madmen and women and children and grandparents or whatever who are going to go full tilt. So um, there, there's good and bad in both situations. I think it's a bit an unpredictable one. Uh, I don't think you want to start trying to make in uh, the calculations of, you know, how many, are they going to be tired? Are they this? Are they going to focus on France? Focus on what Johnny said. Hold the ball, go full tilt, go a plus eight back yourself, back your firepower, back your talents, and just have a proper go at it. And we mentioned him earlier on, Seku Makalu is out. But also, Benji, your man crush, Julien Marchand, is going to be missing, isn't he? So how big a blow is that? I think that's massive, unfortunately. Really, really gutted for him. So like I said, to, I was with his cousin in the car. He dropped me back at the airport, and we called... Um, so Julien's uncle, his cousin's uh, dad, and they were livid. They were like, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's a big blow. I, I've been in those positions when I think you, you must have bust either the cartilage or a rib or something in, 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 in the, 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 the rib cage. But he, as you can imagine, 900 kgs pushing at each other, twisting and turning and popping. And when you're in the middle, stuck there with both your arms out, you can't just buckle down. And mostly what happens is they get so twisted that something breaks. And it's extremely powerful. And I think you saw his face uh, at it when he it busted. Was, you know, he was he was broken from inside. Was limped off a couple of meters. Fair play to him. Tried to go for the next scrum. And as soon as he bent, just, just bending over, not even pushing in the scrum, just bending over was too much pain and he has to come off. So I don't think there's going to be any miracle. I think it's a huge blow because at the moment he's definitely top three world 
uh, Hooker, probably top two. Um, and, and it would have been so interesting to see him play against Cody Taylor, who's also in, in the top three. Uh, and, and again, you, you, need, you need all your weapons out there to go. And I think uh, Johnny BT being a sneaky little thing when he mentioned um, the player breaking out the, the, out of the back of a mall, he met, you were speaking about Peato Movaka, who yeah. completely thought about, about the try line, about him and try to create something. Peato Movaka is an incredibly talented player. Very. He doesn't have the same, he, he's not the same leader as Julien Marchand. And he doesn't have the same, at the moment, rugby ability instead of overall package. So they were, they are going to miss him. Um, they are really, really going to miss him. Uh, I think it's a big blow. And personally, just for him, after losing a final because he broke his knee, after losing this because of suspension, uh, after losing, I mean, poor thing. I think he's he deserves to play the All Blacks. It's going to be a hell of an opportunity. But let's just hope that he pins down in his agenda the 8th of September 2023 being the next time that he plays them in Paris. And aside from Marchand, what are we expecting from Fabian Galtier in terms of selection as well as his tactics? I think Bay by and Movaka are given starters. Tight end, honestly, is still, is still a question mark. I think Hwas, no. Demba Bemba will be on the bench because he's your perfect impact player. Yeah. And do you go for the reliability of Winnie Antonio or do we bring back uh, Mohamed Hawass? I think Hawass will start. Same. But, um, and then, I mean, if you look, if you look at the, the second row, it's going to be a big call. But I think Thibaut Flamand did sensationally well again when he came on. I mean, boys, it's not, you know, to, to blow up his trumpet. But <laughs> when, when, when I saw him play, I obviously, I noticed him quite a bit more because, because we chatted to him and he was such a lovely guy and he's got a, such a good story. But my word, his, his uh, work rate is sensational. It's absolutely phenomenal. Like I was watching it because him and big Paul Villemse are right. And I've got nothing against Paul Villemse, but he tackles four times more than Paul just because he tackles and he's back up in the blink of a fucking second. He's athletic, man. He's just back up nonstop. And I'm not talking about the chop tackle where, you know, you can sort of you, you, use your legs to spin around and get back up. Quite a lot of guys have got that one. I'm talking, you know, those, those really the three man pod forwards that are yeah, slow the, ball, the T bones flying at you. And you've got to dive in the knees. It's a bit of a sacrifice sort of type of tackle. Well, he dives in there for some, I don't know how he does it. And he's still two meters tall. Like he's a, he's a huge thing. And up and he comes out and stuff. So I'm really, really impressed by it. And I think that's how you beat the All Blacks. So that's, that was my point by saying having Jalibert and Intamac, yes, you want to try to do, match athleticism with athleticism. And you want guys who are going to be there and be working their socks off. So I reckon he's he's grabbed a number four jersey and he's, he's going to keep it uh, with with probably... Romain Tao didn't have the biggest game against Georgia, so I think Paul Villemse will probably uh, take 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 back number five. So go back to the starting four and five for the Argentina. In the back row is going to be a funny, funny old chat. But, and um, so, so back row, you've basically got Jelan, Kho, and Aldre started, and then do you bring Walkie, do you bring Walkie back in, or because again, the back row that played like Aldrich was decent, but the other boys didn't really fire. But again, Walkie brings that bit of something special, a bit of a point of difference, especially line-out time. I think Voki is definitely a starter with um, Jelon. And then the third one is decision. Do you put Jelon at six and then you put Aldrit back at eight? Or do you leave Jelon at eight like he, he did against Argentina? And then you put Kroos, who's a good player, mate. He's a really good player. Doesn't and a line-out good, caller. But he's a proper... But Voki was, was good in line-out. Yeah. Um, so, th so that's the big call. I, I see Voki at six, um, Aldrit at eight, and Jelon at seven. Um, but but I could be wrong because Aldri didn't have the most extraordinary game against uh, against Georgia either. But you might want to balance with a bit more power. I don't know. I would, and then I would also bet that they're not going to go a six-two split again. Obviously, they go a bit more balanced. You're playing a completely different game against different opposition, so that six-two split is gone. It's then whether you bring in Gabin Villiers back in to start if um, Matisse Lebel drops out and Villiers yeah, comes back. Matisse Lebel, to be fair, he covers a bit of covers a bit of everything. He's great as well, but Villiers is just, he's got a point of difference again. He's so good at competing for ball, so rapid. His kick chase is awesome. Um, so he'd be my starter coming back in. Um, and the other one, again, French press, I didn't really think about this one, but was Melvin Jaminet calling for him to be dropped. But I think, geez, like the way he's goal kicking, I mean, yes, there was a couple of high balls, didn't quite go his way, but to the call for Brice Doulan to come back in now, I, I don't think so. I, I would stick with uh, Melvin Jaminet, but Afterwards, the rest of the team, I think, picks itself or the, the yeah, backline, so, certainly. So, now if you, so if, you, if you have to go back, I think I'll stick to Melvin Jaminet 
if you think about it's a good point actually that you're making about the 6-2 bench if you go back to 5-3 then Brice Dulin could be your perfect experienced can cover a bit of everything uh, winger and fullback on the bench with uh, Jonathan Danti and, and Lukou um, and then and you stick obviously to the same Gael Ficou Jalibert and stuff and Dupont and all his mates and then the, and then the, the four is like you said Aldrid at 8 Cameron Vauquy at 6 Chenonge at 7 that's how I would go with Thibaut Flamand and, uh, and big Paul Villemse how was probably starting at tight head with Movaka and Cyril Bay? Done. Not long to go now until we get your predictions in for that game. But first, the nominations for World Player of the Year were released this week. Antoine Dupont is in there up against Maro Itoji, Michael Hooper, Sami Karevi. How many, how many <laughs> world players, European I mean, I'm completely lost here. I thought he just won something a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months. Oh, that was six days. That was six European nations. player of the year. Then Six Nations Player of the Year. Clean sweep, mate. He's got the Oscar, Oscar this week. Oscar as well. last night. So no, so he won. So I'm completely lost. <laughs> Six Nations, so he won it. He was Player of Six Nations. Then he was uh, European Player of the Year. He was, wasn't, wasn't he? At his, at Hamish, his first time. Hamish, Hamish Watson was Player of the Six Nations, wasn't he? Yeah, no, he? that was last year, wasn't it? Oh, I completely lost. I don't know. <laughs> I'm I, sure I just, Hamish. I just think much. there's no chance, given the other guys that are in the lineup, there's no chance he doesn't win it. Yeah, I assume you agree, Johnny. Yeah, I, I also think it's really bizarre that there um, there aren't any South Africans or All Blacks on the list, um, which is surprising considering that they beat the Lions, they've just finished off World Cup, they've the All Blacks again have had a fairly phenomenal year. So quite surprising. Again, there's, there's, there's nobody to be nominated. You've got Maro Toje, Michael Hooper, who's been superb to watch, Samu Karevi and Anton Dupont with Itoje. So I don't know, again, for me, like on that list, having watched a lot of international rugby, um, Anton Dupont has just been a phenomenon um, for the past two, three, four seasons. Again, it's been a long time since a Frenchman won it. So it'd be good to see. But again, the way he carries himself, the way he goes in the top 14 week in, week out, every single time he takes the field and for the French team, um, he's been a cut above the rest. So for me, Toto Dupont gets it. And I don't think they would have competed with Antoine Dupont, Benji, but did you know a prop has never been nominated in 20 years for this and only five hookers ever? So do we need to start a bit of a campaign for more front rowers to be nominated? 150%. Um, <laughs> no, but jokes aside, I mean, when you think of how influential a Carl Heyman was at a certain point of time for the All Blacks, when you Beast. think of... Beast, Definitely. Yeah, definitely. How the hell was he never even mentioned? It's not possible. I'm not saying not having a title. That's that's a different conversation. Because if if, if the same year, you know, you've got Dan Carter, Richie Mako, uh, I don't know, Brian O'Driscoll and Beast. Poof, yeah, okay, you pick. It's not easy. But not even nominated. I think it's actually, it's it's, it's, it's a disgrace, really. Um, it's, it's people, Petition started, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But honestly, it's, it's, it's like not even taking the, their role for what it is. I keep on repeating it a, a, a thousand times. The, the, you want more space in, in rugby, then start loving scrum more. It's the only reason why we still have a little bit of space is because we can get a Winnie Antonio and an Antoine Dupont to play in the same team. And Antoine Dupont, uh, he's going to prove me wrong any second, but at the moment, can't scrummish for shit. And that's, the, that's probably the only thing he can't do. And hallelujah, because, <laughs> because uh, it makes me feel a little bit better about what I used to do. <laughs> but um, it's, it's true that it's the only reason why we have a bit of a bit of space, a bit of a few gaps here and there is because guys get so tired in, the, in this crazy energy eating machine, which is a scrum. Um, then you need the different body shapes. And that's the only reason why, why we love our, our game so much, because you need a bit of diversity of, of body types, of compositions, of weight, of way of handling yourself and all that. Otherwise, it would be mega boring. So start loving people. You got to forget about the petition about world rugby <laughs> front rows petition about keeping the scrum exactly how it is but people just showing a bit of love for it right before we get your predictions in it's about time we did our meter moment of the week do you want to talk us through it benji well the meter obviously being the the, the best way in the world to make sure that your meat is cooked properly by testing its temperature you don't want it to be too hot um and so the idea is to 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 stick on the, the best moment that we appreciated the most that we thought that was the hottest that the best. Um, let, let's face it, I would love to take some, something out of France, Georgia. I would love to say that my meter moment was probably my dinner in Bordeaux on Saturday night, but 
the reality is that you, you gotta you gotta take your hats off to to the Irish and just to say that Ireland New Zealand was absolutely out of this world in terms of intensity that I thought they did a sensational job and I'll, I'll give my meter moment not so much to uh, you could have given it to this number six it's Kel, Colin Doris Der, Doris is that his name Colin Doris yeah Colin Doris. Doris sorry for the pronunciation wow did he have a storm of a game scored a brilliant try uh, ran you know for 80 minutes absolutely non-stop but I'll give it to the big fella to show a bit of love I thought Ty Furlong had one storm of a game I mean and I, there's not yeah, even nominated one moment. he <laughs> absolutely flipping dominated for 80 minutes and their scrum was sensational but I think his ball handling ability was out of this world and you talk about ball possession there was moments where everybody was on the floor and he was the big fella there and then either trucking it up to get a bit of momentum or just hitting it behind but for Johnny Sexton almost on the spot so my my meter moment of, of the weekend will be just the overall 80 minute performance of Furlong mate I in complete agreement just in general Again, for a team that hadn't beaten New Zealand to have now beaten them, I think, three times in the past five years, something crazy like that. Um, again, meter of the meter moment of the weekend for me is the Irish performance. 100% agree, Benji. Um, again, the thought that went behind it, Farrell, O'Connell, the manner in which they execute on the field, the players, the way they performed. And as I mentioned before, the way they made New Zealand look like ordinary human beings, which we never think they are. Um, that performance by Ireland, again, I agree with you, Benji, 100% was my meter moment of the weekend. Hard to argue with that. And we look forward to giving it to someone in a France jersey next week. <laughs> that was Johnny and Benji's meter moment of the week. And meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer. And they've made over 9 million cooks better with their revolutionary app as well. So it's no surprise their users are growing rapidly every day. If you've ever said your pork or turkey's dry, then meters for you. And you can use it on a barbecue, in an oven, or in a pan. Enter a whole new world of cooking and join the metaverse at meter.com and just use the code FRENCHPOD10 at checkout for 10% off any full price item as well. Well, let's finish off by getting your predictions in then for the upcoming weekend of the Autumn Nation series. And it's one final chance to win some pints and prove you know more than Johnny and Benji in the Guinness Pint Predictor on Match Pint. Anyone listening could join in, even if you haven't done it for the past few weeks, and you might just win yourself a pint or two of Guinness. It's really simple. Just download the Match Pint app, predict the scores, beat your mates, and win pints of Guinness. And to compete against Johnny and Benji, all you need to do is enter our private league with the code LaRugby. The overall winner of that will get a very special prize at the end as well. Do you know how you're getting on, Johnny, Benji? How you doing? I don't know, mate. I thought I was doing pretty well until last week was a massacre. I, I was I was cheering for um, I was cheering for Scotland and they oh you idiot and then, <laughs> why did you do that and then I actually backed I actually backed NZ against uh, against Ireland I think so by, by for a close for a close win so so completely pooped now you can't be doing worse than Johnny what happened last week Johnny <laughs> uh, yeah look it would appear that it isn't exactly hard to know more than me about this sport because I think. <laughs> In every league that I'm part of in match point, I seem to be propping up the bottom of the table. So that's what happens, mate. You go with your gut, you go with your country, and you get absolutely panned. Um, yeah, I think I am rock bottom of pretty much everything. I'm even below Jim Hamilton, which is embarrassing. Oh. <laughs> that is really <laughs> scraping the barrel. So, yeah, get it right this weekend. But only 18 points between you. So, you know, it's up for grabs. You there can do go. it, Johnny. Just need one perfect score. I'll be back up there. Don't worry. Well, go on. Speaking about scores, are we not going to give our predictions now? Let's do it. Italy, Uruguay, Benji, go. Oh, I thought you completely, completely off guard. I was only in France, <laughs> New Zealand, mate. That's what I was ready for. Was it Italy, Uruguay? I'll give Italy by 25. Oof, Italy by 35. Scotland, Japan, Johnny. Scotland, oh, closer. It's definitely going to be way closer than Japan, Ireland. Um, and I'm hoping Scotland can do a number on them and get one up and a bit of revenge after World Cup. So I'll go Scotland by seven. I'll go Scotland by 12. Ireland, Argentina? Uh, Ireland by 14. Comfortable, I would say. Our Argentina last game of the year, absolutely pooped, exhausted. I'll go Ireland, yeah. by, Ireland by nine. 
Wales, Australia, lots of injuries in this one. I saw a little tweet earlier. This could be one of the first games that could almost start with uncontested scrums. That's how much they're battling. Um, I'm going to go Australia by four. Ooh, I'm going to go Wales by six. This is where I'm going to catch you up, Benji. I can tell. Perfect score. It's coming. <laughs> England, South Africa. South cool. Africa to complete a clean sweep and beat England by seven. Yeah, I've got I've got Safa by six. Okay. The one we've all been waiting for. It's about time. Is he going to pick it? Is he going to do it? France, New Zealand, Benji. All right. Not only will I, I will tell you exactly the score. That's that's a given. <laughs> okay. The score is the score is going to be 17-16 for France. So France by one. And because France are gonna have nine, I was trying to work a score that actually reflected something. <laughs> I'm gonna score 12 points off the boot and then and, and just a, a five point try. So that's 17. But New Zealand will convert their try because they will score two. I don't know, just before half time, whether it's gonna be sneaky or just before the end, they're gonna give us a proper fright. It's gonna be very, very complicated all the way to the last second. Um, and but then they're going to score uh, less penalties than us. 17-16, done deal. Antoine Dupont, uh, man of the match, probably a striker, uh, running it on the pitch at the 60 seconds. Streaker. Uh, <laughs> streaker. A streaker to come. <laughs> That's for the bonus point victory in case we're, we're equal. And then a, a, a night to be remembered and a beautiful, beautiful firework display at the end of the game. Oh, That's mate, a- I, like, I feel your passion for this one. That was beautiful. Um, I wish I was there with you. And as much as I love my French teammates and former teammates, I'm worried. Um, just after certain facets of that game against Georgia, I'm worried about them. Um, and I think that they will be extremely passionate. I think they'll have a huge, amazing crowd behind them. Like you said, Benji, I think it will also be really cool for Antoine Dupont, hopefully to go, Toe to toe with Aaron Smith, that would be very cool. But I just, I don't know. I just think that they maybe don't have enough in the tank, and I think this might be a big learning lesson for them and for the coaching staff as well. So I'm going to go New Zealand, not by the biggest of margins, but New Zealand by eight points. A couple of differences there: Wales, Australia, France, New Zealand, all to play for on the Guinness Pint Predictor on Match Pint, and we look forward to looking back, particularly on France, New Zealand. And seeing whether all of your Nostradamus predictions can come true, Benji. Well, yeah, I can I can only let my heart speak, but at least you know I go, I back my passport. <clears throat> huh? So uh, that's the only thing that I will add for that. That's what Johnny. That's what Johnny did last week. It didn't turn out too well, Benji. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Benji. Thanks, Johnny. And a big thanks to all you guys for listening as well. Make sure you hit subscribe. Leave us a nice review if you can as well. In fact, if you haven't left us a review already, only takes 30 seconds, do it. We'll read a couple out, won't we? We'll get you to read them out, Benji, next week. If anyone leaves us a nice review, leave us a question as well, a little comment, get Benji to read it out next week. Done. Agreed. Check us out on Rugby Pass as well as on YouTube, and we'll be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, guys. Cheers. Thanks, boys. Bye.